Hey everybody. Hey everybody. There's Buddy. Welcome to part three of our series on these mid-60s Harmony amplifiers. In this, uh, in this episode, we're going to take a look at that Harmony H415 right back yonder. So stick around. All right, here we are with the back door removed, and we have a schematic, uh, which may or may not help us out. It's always nice to have them. And we'll see how close it is to the schematic. Uh, also, we have a mismatched set of uh, screws, and I don't think these screws are original anyway, because these should have been like um, nut driver type screws rather than Phillips. And here's a good look at the speakers, and uh, just judging by the codes here, I can tell these are from 1964 on this one, the fourth week of 1964. It's a C12R. And this other one is a 1965 10th week C12R. I do believe these are probably original, um, but I really can't account for the years difference in date unless one of them was just kind of shoved to the back of the shelf and kind of languished there for a little while. Something else we notice here is that the uh, cabinet itself is made of a plywood while the baffle board is made of a composite material kind of like a masonite or chipboard material. And just like the H410 Harmony amp from earlier in this series the whole baffle and uh, chassis and everything comes out in one piece just like this. Let's get this thing up on the bench and get a closer look at it. Okay, the tube complement on this thing. Uh, we have a couple of 12AX7s up front. Uh, we have a couple of 6BQ5s or EL84s. Uh, we also have a 6A... I think it's a 6AU6 for the Tremolo. Uh, yes, that's correct. 6AU6. And this is the only tube that actually doesn't look original to the amp. I don't think it is. Uh, this is a Sylvania. It's a Jan Sylvania. Looks like it's from 1971. I think I think that's the code. 7126. So yeah, I think this is a replacement. So that tells me someone at least was trying to fix the Tremolo at one time. Uh, so I look for it to possibly be bad now. I can't remember what the previous owner said was wrong with it, but I do know he said it wasn't right. Uh, we have a Harmony labeled 5Y3. says Japan on it, so that's a Japanese made two from 1966, 21st week. Uh, these 6BQ5s don't have any codes on those. Those are all rubbed off. Um, these preamp tubes also say Japan on those. It's kind of hard to see. But they do say Japan on them. They're pretty dirty. And they're Harmony labeled. Both of the uh, both of those tubes. So we're going to clean off the tubes, clean out the tube sockets, clean the tube pins as well because they look pretty corroded. Um, and so that's kind of where we'll start. This also gives us a chance to take a look at the transformers. Here's the output transformer here. That XA415 is probably the model number, and you can see the 415 is an echo of the model number of this Harmony. And I think uh, these are custom labeled. Whoever made these custom labeled those for Harmony. So when they stored them, uh, they knew which ones went with which. And I've seen that in the past as well. Uh, this is a Schumacher 606 code for the manufacturer. 1966 20th week. And you can see there X415 on that one as well. So that uh, this one may also be a Schumacher, but they just did not stamp it in the usual way. But whoever they were having do this, uh, you can see that they had the 415 echoed in the model numbers on both of those transformers. And just like taking the baffle out of the cabinet, um, the chassis is held in with a couple of quarter inch nut driver screws, one on this end and one on the other end. We'll go ahead and remove those. This might be a good time to tell you uh, this amplifier, the, the H415 Harmony, 
um, was one that uh, Ken Fisher of Trainwreck Amplifier fame uh, lauded as uh, one of the one of the amplifiers he uh, claimed to be a real sleeper amp. He used to write a lot of articles and things like that, and uh, he's revered nowadays. He uh, passed away, but his amps are kind of high end, way up there. I mean, if you wanted to buy one of his amps, they're, you'd be shelling out many, many grand. Um, but he was one of the you know those guru type guys that everybody kind of looks to. Um, for advice and as an example and he loved this amp um, at least from what I've read so um, and you'll see why here in a bit but let's see why this thing is it oh actually there's a couple other screws I need to take this one out and that one there as well yeah someone's definitely been in here before the uh, two-prong power cord has been changed somebody changed that cord at some point by the look of it it's just a new looking cord and also they've put these quick disconnect uh, terminals on the speaker leads uh, which is which is nice uh, but it does indicate someone's been in here before and I mentioned that because you know if an amp if someone's been in one before you never know what you're gonna find um, you know inside of a virgin amplifier that no one's ever touched you kinda have a good reasonable expectation of what you're gonna see but not necessarily the case when someone's been in there before all right, here's our first look at the guts, um, and just preliminarily here, it looks like, I don't know, man, it looks like everything is original in here, with the exception of the, of the power cord. Those solders are, have definitely been monkeyed with, but the rest, everything else looks original to me. Um, it does have some, it does have some mismatched uh, capacitors. It's got some good alls here. Uh, it's got one from Japan right here, which actually jives with the uh, uh, with the Japanese tubes as well. Those good alls are definitely original, uh, both the white ones and the brown ones. That Japanese one right there looks original as well because the solders are uh, just, they look correct. So I'm pretty sure that's original also. I'll try to preserve this as much as I can. Um, there's a good chance all these good alls are probably pretty good. I've had good luck with good alls personally. I don't know about some of you guys, but you know, they usually hold up alright from what I could tell in my past experiences. Um, they're pretty well sealed. I think that's that's what they have going for them. The ones that uh, the ones that tend to not be good are those sprigs, um, these black beauties and bumblebees. Those those can be all over the place. But we'll check all these good alls. I'll check um, voltages on the grids of the tubes and everything, and see if. Uh, uh, see if it's all okay. We'll dial it up slowly on the Variac here just to get started. Okay, I have this thing dialed up about halfway on the Variac over there, and uh, we're just going to check some voltages. And this is just standard procedure. This is the sort of thing I um, do anytime I'm firing something up for the first time. So we want to hook our negative lead up to the chassis. We'll take our positive lead. Uh, keeping one hand back and some of you will say well you know why do you why are you still wearing your rings <laughs> and all that kind of stuff well that's because this ring uh, belonged to my uh, granddad and I always wear it and I've never had any problems with it getting snagged on anything so I wear it uh, and that's my wedding ring so that's why I wear my rings okay we're getting 67 volts right there I think that's the first I think that's the first node. And we're getting uh, 62 volts there. 47 and a half volts right there. And that's going to be a cathode. That's a cathode bypass capacitor for the output tubes. Uh, and speaking of output tubes, 64 volts right there. I think that's the Plates, yeah. Yeah, there's a cat. Okay. No, there's the 
there's the plate. And that should be a screen. So those have pretty pretty rock steady uh, voltages right there. Okay, now on to the twelve AX sevens. Let's check the check the plates there. There's one of the plates, fifty five volts. And also go to the other side of that capacitor right there, and that checks this capacitor. So that capacitor is good. I don't see any voltage really there. I don't see any voltage to speak of right there either. Well, there is one. There is one volt. Fifty volts there. There is one volt on that. On that grid so that might be a slight concern let's see let's see this one uh, there we go thirty seven volts on uh, pin one forty volts on pin six There's our 37 volts. This is the capacitor to the next stage, and there's no voltage there, so there's no leakage there at all on that one. So that's that's a good capacitor. That's a good capacitor. This one's questionable. 40 volts right there, and no volts right there, so that's a good capacitor. There's 50 volts right there. Nothing on the other side of it. 52 volts right there. And nothing on the other side of it. So those are probably good. As long as the values are good. These are in the uh, tremolo circuit. Or the tremolo circuit. If you want to be that way about it. So 52 volts right there, and no volts to speak of on the other side of that one. So pretty much all these capacitors are good. The only questionable one is this one here. Uh, so we will put that under our hats and keep that in mind that this might be a bad capacitor because I am seeing a little bit more voltage there than I would, than I would want to see. But then again, that might be coming from elsewhere. Okay, yeah, I think actually this voltage uh, through this resistor, because we got two and a half volts right there, and then it goes through a resistor here down about 1.1 volts. So I don't think I don't think this capacitor is the uh, culprit in that voltage right there. I think it's coming from the other side of this. So that capacitor is probably good as well. So we've already ascertained, um, you know, the amp fires up. Uh, we're actually getting some sound out of the speaker. We can go ahead and dial it all on, on up if we want to. Uh, I'm pretty confident everything should be fine. I don't see anything. None of these resistors look black or anything like that. I think the only thing I may have to do is replace that uh, CAN capacitor, uh, which is the original one. We'll see, though. Um, I've had some really good luck with, with CAN capacitors from this era, the mid-60s. Uh, all the ones I usually see in Valco amps and in cheaper amps like this, um, they usually are name brand stuff. This one might even be a Mallory or something. But uh, capacitors, multi-section cans like that, usually for me, in my experience, they've held up pretty well uh, from the 60s. So let's go ahead and dial it on up. Uh, and we'll monitor, actually we'll turn this back on and monitor some of the voltages. Put it on the first note, I guess. And we'll just keep that under monitor. And dial it up a little bit at a time. Uh, kind of pause, let it sit for a while, dial it up. In the hopes that we're not just going to shock that capacitor. Alright, I've dialed it up a little bit further. And you probably aren't going to be able to hear it. Uh, but you can see the numbers here jumping around for the voltage. 
And they're jumping around because uh, the tremolo works. Noticing a little bit of crackling uh, going on through the output. And that seems to be a definitely a, a fault of uh, dust and dirt in the, in the tube sockets. Yeah, both, both of these preamp tube sockets are going to need to be cleaned and retentioned. Okay, so I noticed I'm getting a lot of this little snap, crackle, and pop uh, bull crap going on here. Uh, and usually the first thing I do if, when that happens is clean the tube sockets, and I've already done that. Uh, so I got to kind of poking around in here, and this right here, you hear that? You hear that little pop right there? Now I don't know if this is all of it. You see that little connection right there. That connection is not even all the way on there. And that's that's like that from the factory. <laughs> so this is another one of those incidents where, you know, they're making these things so fast uh, that they uh kind of miss a connection there so let's solder let's shut this thing down it's been burning quite a while uh, and we'll re-solder that and fire it back up and see if that helped all right I got that connection soldered the next thing I want to do is come in here on these little ground contacts and uh, just with a bent piece of very fine grit sandpaper burnish these contacts and then I'll also clean all these input jacks as well Okay, so I'm noticing these power resistors. They are a little bit crusty. This one, this one is a uh, certainly a bit crusty, and this one kind of looks it as well. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and swap those out for some metal film. All right, that resistor right there is supposed to be uh, this one, which is a 10k one watt resistor. Uh, but it is at 12.4 K, so that's over 20%. So that one probably should go anyway, even if it wasn't crusty. This other one connected to one of uh, its legs is a 560 ohm 1 watt resistor. Uh, that is for the screens. And that's that guy right there. So he's going to get replaced as well. And we may actually up his value to about a uh, a 1K. Okay, so that's those two resistors installed. Uh, now we're going to install the three-prong cord. And we're going to remove this death cap right here. Okay, so I have the three-prong cord uh, in here. Death cap removed. Uh, those are replaced. And the snap, crackle, pop is completely gone all right and now that the electronic servicing is complete we're going to turn our attention to the cosmetics on this thing and it's pretty uh pretty gnarly and pretty rusty to say the least you know you got spots like that that we're going to have to try to do something about and it won't come completely clean i'm i'm sure of that but we can get it much better than it is now we'll also Pull these tubes out one at a time and uh, clean those off a little bit as well. Okay, now we turn our attention to this faceplate, which has got uh, quite a bit of rust on it. Uh, what we're going to do is try to um, get this off. Well, first I've already wiped it down with a, a warm, wet rag uh, just to get the dirt off. Um, obviously, that's not going to get rust off, but uh, we're going to try some baking soda first and see if we can't make this work so let's see what a little bit of baking soda will do uh, to the rust and I'll try a couple of spots
Well, I think that might have actually helped somewhat. I don't want to go over the lettering too much, but it does look like it's cleaning it. Okay, this chassis is obviously coming a little bit cleaner with this baking soda, so that was probably a, a half-decent choice. The worst part on the, the chassis is over here by the input jacks, and even there it's not too bad. It's not nearly as bad as it was. Still got, you, I mean, you can still tell there was a lot of corrosion. Um, but at this point, uh, we're trying to get the knobs back on this thing, and um, some of these are pretty loosely fitting. Uh, and this is something you can do anytime you have a split shaft uh, on your pots like these. What I mean by split shaft is you have a piece over here and a piece over here. Uh, that creates the knurled uh, shaft knob holders here. Um, what you can do if you have like a, a screwdriver, you can stick right down in between those, those two parts and very carefully... Uh, you don't want to do it all at once, uh, but you can gently kind of pry to one side and pry to the other side, and that should spread the um, that should spread the split shafts apart just a, enough so that your knobs will fit more snugly, and that way they won't fall off. So if you have a, a problem with some of your knobs popping off or being real loose on the on the shafts uh, that's one fix for that all right this thing actually came fairly clean I'm I'm pretty happy with the results I mean considering it was just baking soda basically that I used okay this, again the scroll cloth is kind of uh, loose in places so we're going to use our uh, Air dryer to tighten this up a bit. Got a couple places on this amp uh, where the covering is coming up, and we're just gonna use actually super glue to glue the bits down that we can. So, like this little piece here, we'll just spread some super glue around on the piece and what you do here when the, with the super glue is basically just uh, kind of wipe it repeatedly until it stays kind of like this because you have to this stuff will continually try to curl back up on you so you have to kind of wipe it and wipe it again and again until it just stays down and the idea here being that you don't want it to you don't want it to come up you want it to lay flat so that you can touch this area up where you're going to have some missing material Okay, so that's a lot better right there. Uh, at least it's laying down flat. We're going to do the same thing on some of the uh, other areas, like up here on this corner right here, where it's coming up as well.
And this corner over here on this side, you can see there are a couple of larger kind of rips. And this is uh, rolled up right here, and this one's rolled back, and you get a rip here. And we're going to roll, um, lay all this down as well. <clears throat> This is fairly typical of the type of uh, damage that you see on vintage amplifiers, uh, coverings, or Tolex, or whatever you want to call it. Tolex is actually a specific brand of material, and it's kind of become, because it was used on uh, fenders, it's kind of become uh, the household name or branding just to call all amp coverings Tolex, which really isn't accurate. So we really have to get the super glue up in here well enough to get every part kind of saturated. And you want to lay down the part, uh, make sure you lay down the parts that need to go down first. If you start with those, like that piece right there has to go down before this piece. And it's just a matter of being patient and hitting it over and over again with your finger. I use my fingers on this because it's really easy to con control and your fingers kind of absorb the excess glue as you go. And then I might go back and use like the, a screwdriver butt end or something to kind of smooth everything down. Like see that one almost totally disappear right there. By the time we get that down, that one, that rip right there almost totally disappeared by just laying down the existing pieces. There's a temptation to rip those off and then touch them up, but that's not what you want to do. You want to try to glue them back down as much as you can and save the material and lay it down. And right here, while this material is pretty, pretty good and pliable because it's not going to be very pliable, by the time the uh, super glue all soaks in, so we want to make sure we get that laid flat as we can while it's pliable. And this corner almost, almost will have healed up entirely. We've got a couple little dings we can touch up, a little bit missing there. But overall, I'd say that's pretty good. Okay, more tears and folds along the back edges. The corners, as you can see, are usually pretty prone to this. Man, I'd say, I'd say that's a little better too, wouldn't you? There's another example of one that laid right back down and almost won't need any touch up at all. Okay, now that all the covering is glued back down, we're going to get some uh, artist's oil paint, uh, just regular stuff you can get at the paint store, and uh, paint up some of these areas, just touch them up uh, real lightly. And we're using actually oil uh, because once it dries, it will resist uh, being diluted by water. I guess you could say I'm very hands-on with this stuff. I can um, do it a lot easier without a brush. I just use I just use my fingertips um, on this sort of thing to kind of lightly uh, brush it into the area with my fingers. Seems to be a little bit easier for me to kind of clean up the excess uh, when I use my fingers. You don't want to do this if you have a hand modeling job coming up because your fingers, between the super glue and the, and the paint, your fingers are going to be messed up. But 
Uh, and what you also want to do is kind of blend it in with the surrounding area. You don't want to just do right on top of the area because what that's going to do is it's going to end up, uh, it's going to, you will see that. So what you want to do is kind of blend it in a little bit with the surrounding. So I have this black and I'm just kind of moving it out just a little bit from the area. So it's not just on that one spot. Just like that. All right, this thing is finished and ready for a test. And we'll just kind of look over our handiwork here on the cabinet. And you can see some of the places we touched up and pushed everything back down. That place was particularly bad, if you'll recall. A lot of rust on this faceplate at first. You can still see the pitting, of course, but you know, it's better better than it was sometimes if you get too many reflections that this thing wants to focus on the reflections plus I'm getting eat up by mosquitoes right here that corner came out particularly good there's a, there's a big uh, problem down here too on this corner and that looks pretty perfect same over here the rear now looks pretty good too the most work we did on the rear was up here on this corner and it's not perfect but a hell of a lot better and here's what I have to show for it. <laughs>
on this uh, mid-60s Harmony H415. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Hit the subscribe button below if you have. Also, while I'm at it, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for passing 20,000 subscribers. This channel's been growing by leaps and bounds, and uh, you guys are pretty awesome. Uh, I look forward to all the comments on all the videos and our banter back and forth and everything. It's real fun. So thanks, everybody, for that. Uh, also, um, I recently had someone reach out to me for an interview, uh, and if you guys want to read that, there's a magazine, art well, an online magazine article. I'll post the link down here in the description. Um, do me a favor and go to their page and like say lots of really nice things about me. <laughs> anyway, thanks you guys. I appreciate it. Have a good one.